On Spotify, you can get thousands of podcasts, including ours, as well as a bunch of the most popular news and politics shows for free. Go beyond clickbait with new episodes of The Daily by The New York Times, Up First by NPR, The Weeds by Vox, and much more. Just open the app, tap search, type in your favorite show name, and get streaming. Download the free app and start listening to podcasts on Spotify today. This week on Myths and Legends, we're in Persian mythology, talking about probably its most famous hero, Rostam. You'll see why that pet elephant might be a bad idea for your super buff five-year-old, and why it's always a good idea to call your mom on ancient world FaceTime, especially if she's a mythological bird who's going to coach you through a medical procedure. The creature this time is why you should stay inside during lightning storms. Not for the obvious safety reason, but because of the deadly rabbits that will shoot at you at 65 miles per hour if you interrupt them while mating. This is Myths and Legends, episode 129A, The Mammoth That Rides. This is a podcast where I tell stories from mythology and folklore. Some are incredibly popular stories you think you know, but with surprising origins. Others are stories that might be new to you, but are definitely worth a listen. Rostam, the central character of these next few episodes, is quite possibly the biggest character of pre-Islamic Persian mythology. He's one of the main characters of a text called the Shanama. Like any good epic hero, the story of Rostam doesn't actually start with Rostam, but with his parents, and how the birth of his father, the future epic hero Zal, was super disappointing. Hey, said Sam, the king's champion, knocking on the door. He just wanted to check if everything was okay. His lady had gone into labor, and he hadn't heard anything. That was like a week ago, so, I mean, everything okay? Wait, what's with all the tears? Sam was starting to see some major red flags. He spotted his partner across the room sitting up in bed, holding a baby. Sam exhaled. All right, good. So she was okay, and the baby was alive, and... What could be so bad? Ah. Sam looked at the new mother, then back to the baby, then back to mom. You gave birth to a tiny old man? The woman shook her head. No, it, he was a baby. He had just had completely white hair and was spotted in places like a leopard. The mother tried to convince him that it wasn't all bad. The spots were kind of cool and Anderson Cooper and John Slattery both had silver hair and they were good looking guys. It would be okay, she insisted. However, Sam could see nothing more than a demon when he looked upon the child. He refused to listen to the mother's pleas, instead ripping the baby from her arms. She rose from bed and struggled after him, begging to know what he was doing. But Sam only replied that he was going to take the baby to Simurg. As far as abandoning your child in the wilderness goes, it went off without a hitch. Sam was so convinced that it was a demon child that he didn't hesitate at all in leaving the baby out in the open in the black fields surrounding Samurg's home. None of his men had a crisis of conscience either. And, upon return, Sam never gave the baby another thought. It was better this way. Samurg, the massive mythological peacock with the head of a dog, wouldn't be able to pass up on a free kid meal. Sure, the baby was smaller than Samurg's usual lunches of elephants and such, but at least it would be easy for her babies to digest. Sam wasn't wrong about that. Smurg landed to see the baby screaming in the heat of the day. Ugh, humans. If this thing was a leopard, at least they would have weaned it and shaded it from the heat. Oh well, lunchtime. Smurg scooped the baby up in her massive talons and took it, crying, all the way back to her nest. At the nest, the chicks looked on the baby. Did... did humans always sound like that? Smurg shook her dog head. No, only the ones tragically abandoned by their parents to die in the wilderness. All right, eat up. The chicks looked on the screaming infant and inched closer, but their little bird shoulders slumped. They couldn't. They just couldn't do it. There was no way they could chomp a screaming baby, no matter how plump and tender it looked. Smurg sighed. Yeah, she knew. She was really hoping they wouldn't think about it and just dig in but the apple didn't fall far from the tree. She wouldn't be able to eat it either. All right, let's find a place for it to sleep. O 
Okay, I get it. Sam screamed out after he woke up. It had been years since he thought of his boy, the one he'd left for the giant dog bird. For years, the entire incident was out of sight, out of mind. But now, he found himself plagued by nightmares of celestial beings berating him for being worse than an animal. An animal cared for its young, but he had left his defenseless boy to die. Except that he had actually survived and thrived. The Samork had raised him, and there were rumors in the region from caravans of travelers passing through. Stories of a naked man with a broad chest and flowing silver hair jumping among the rocks. They were all true. Sam's child had lived, and it was time for the father to go get his son. That's why, weeks later, Sam was bowing low before the mountain, crying out to all who would hear him how wrong he was, how his son wasn't a demon, but loved by his father. He wanted his son to come home. The sky's my dad? The young man asked his giant bird dog ma from atop the mountain. The smirk shrugged. She guessed? He seemed pretty torn up about the whole thing. And generally, humans just move through this region as quickly as possible. Her money was on yes. Yes, it was. And now the young man needed to go. It did end up taking some convincing. But the young man finally agreed to go. The smirk could tell. Not only by the fact that he had survived being abandoned as a baby and being raised by birds, but by how strong and how good he was. That he would be one of those humans that were truly great. He had a destiny beyond these mountains. When his abandonment helped support, and it was time for him to reach out and claim it, his father called. It was time to go. Down the boy climbed, making his way skillfully down the cliffs. And, with two of the Smurg's feathers in his hair, he approached his father for the first time. Weeping, the man embraced the son he thought was dead. He was so, so sorry. The son held the father, and together they made their way back down to Sam's caravan. Zal. His name was Zal. The young man stood, now fully clothed, before the king. Clothes were a weird sensation, but he was getting used to them. He looked on the aged man sitting before him, and his father bowing low, and figured he should follow suit. He bowed low, and accepted his charge. Everyone had wanted to meet the boy raised in a nest, the king most of all. Sam had been his champion for years. But Sam had been his champion for years. He was getting older, and the minute the king saw this young man, with his chest and arms like a lion, he asked if the boy would swear himself to the king on this day. Beaming, Sam agreed, and so Zal entered the king's service. She's really good looking, the slave girl said to Zal, slave boy. Her eyelashes are like raven's wings and her mouth is so tiny that she can barely breathe. Beautiful. And yes, that's an actual description of the woman's beauty from the text. The woman, of course, was Princess Rudaba, and Zal was in love with her. Now, if you've lived in exile with your bird mom for decades, and only now returned home to meet your birth parents, the very next thing you're obviously going to want to do is leave for months and go explore the region. So that's what Zal did. He went to India, and there he met a king. Unfortunately, Zal's great plans to make friends and marry said king's daughter, whose beauty he heard about from hundreds of miles away, did not go according to plan. It probably had something to do with Zal openly calling the king a demon at dinner, because he practiced a different religion. A religion Zal himself likely learned about like three weeks ago. But who knows? Regardless, he was not invited back. Undeterred, he stayed in the area. Somehow, Zal needed to get this woman's attention. So he shot birds into the river while her servants were bathing. Every action has a reaction, so Zal quickly learned a couple of things. His stunt actually paid off, and the servants didn't mind getting blood all over them in the bath, because Zal was just so fantastic to look at. And two, Rudaba already knew about him, and she was just as in love with him as he was with her. Now, there's a lot going on here that we're not going to go into, Sam, Zal's father, hates Rudaba's parents because he also thinks that they're demons. Rudaba's parents hate Zal because Zal was rude to them one time. And yet, 
despite the animosity, the pair meets. And one night, Rudaba lets down her several stories long black hair for Zao to climb up and spend the night. Forced to face reality, both parental parties decide to make up and deal with the fact that their kids have fallen for each other. It's more than compassion for their kids, though. Sam ends up consulting oracles, only to learn that the greatest hero to ever set foot on the planet will actually result from this union. And Rudaba's parents realize that if they don't let the kids get married, the Persians are going to burn down their city and murder them all. If you think that this is a great way to have Thanksgiving dinner spill over into a violent blood feud, you're absolutely right. Especially when you consider that it isn't just Sam who dislikes Rudaba's kingdom, but his own king, too. Well, the king decides to put a stop to all this talk of uniting his kingdom with a lesser one and orders Sam, Zal's father, to sack Rudaba City. The only issue was that the king underestimated just how inescapably awesome Zal really was. Zal personally went to the king to make the case for Rudaba's hand in marriage, and there he faced two separate tests. The first was a fun little riddle party, where, just like Bilbo Baggins, his life depended on the correct answers. The second, a trial by combat, of course, saw him facing the greatest warriors in the kingdom. Zal quickly knocked the riddle party out of the park before mercilessly winning in the arena. In the end, it was because Zal sent several men to the hospital and or morgue that the king was convinced that he was sufficiently in love. So, after like 40 pages of back and forth for something you knew was going to happen anyway, Zal and Rudaba were married. <laughs> Soon, Rudaba became pregnant. Months passed, and then many more months passed. Seeing as the third trimester wasn't supposed to last a full year, Rudaba began to suspect that something had gone wrong. Her servants worried about her too, and so they called Zal into the room and told him everything. He smiled. It was time to call his mom. She would know what to do. Zal walked softly into the room. Rudaba had been bedridden for nearly a year and a half and he wished he had gone to her sooner. He lit a fire and pulled something very special out of his pack. A feather, one that Smirk had given him when they parted. He had only two of these precious feathers, but his wife was worth it. He dropped it in the fire, and smoke began to fill the room. Hey, Mom, Zal waved. His dog bird mom illuminated the smoke, in what I can only assume was like an ancient world Skype. Zal told her that the baby inside his wife was just too strong and manly, and he couldn't come out. He needed another way. What follows is only slightly paraphrased. Basically, Smurg looked at Rudaba and said that the woman was going to need to get drunk. Like, really drunk. Because this was going to hurt. You know what? She should probably just start now and not stop until she was unconscious. Because after Rudaba was out, they would call in a guy with a knife. Yeah they were going to invent a new medical procedure. Basically, they were going to do a cesarean section, which is a major surgery now, but was basically a death sentence back then, or would have been, to anyone without a magical bird mom coaching them through it. Rudaba just wanted the pain to end, so she agreed to start drinking while Zal found a sorcerer with a knife. They returned just as Rudaba fell asleep. Softly, the sorcerer whispered a spell, and he began to cut. A priest came by to sew the wound once Rudaba had given birth, and he used a mixture of healing herbs that the Smurg had dictated. Zal massaged his wife's wound, and she woke up a day later, a bit dehydrated, no doubt, but otherwise completely healed in the world's fastest recovery from a C-section. The baby was named Rostam, essentially the word for escape, because Rudaba had escaped her pain and peril when the baby was born. Everyone in the kingdom celebrated the new son of the champion, and the occasion of his birth brought even the commoners and nobles together in celebration. We'll see what happens with this extremely exceptional child, but that will be right after this. Support for today's show comes from Simply Safe. If you've been thinking about getting a Simply Safe home security system, but you've been waiting for the holidays when all the tech deals come out, you've made a smart move. Because, right now, I can get you a great deal on Simply Safe. 
If you go to simplysafe.com slash legends, you'll get 25% off any new system. That's an amazing deal. They rarely do anything like this, but they're doing it just for us. Simply Safe is great protection for your home and family. There are no hidden fees, and they don't make you sign a contract. They're also getting great reviews. CNET, PC Mag, and Wirecutter all say Simply Safe is the best security system there is. So, if you're looking for a security system and want a great deal, go to simplysafe.com slash legends to save 25%. Please make sure to use that unique URL too, because it really helps out the show. That's simplysafe.com slash legends. simplysafe.com slash legends. And hurry, this deal ends November 26th. Support for today's show comes from Blue Apron. It's simple. Blue Apron delivers fresh, perfectly proportioned ingredients right to your door that you can use to cook incredible, restaurant-quality meals in as little as 20 minutes. It's what you need and how to make it, all in a single box that makes mealtime easy enough for even us. You can choose from a variety of step-by-step, chef-designed recipe options, all with insanely delicious flavors. Then, you know, ditch the grocery list and let Blue Apron do all the meal prep for you. Whether you're looking for quick, easy meals or a full culinary cooking experience, Blue Apron has you covered. Our schedule varies a lot. So we always try to pick up both a quick and easy recipe and a fancier meal every week. You know, something we might not normally try. I love knowing I have everything I need to make something great at home, like the southern-style rice bowl we just ate, or the fontina and sourdough grilled cheese we're doing tomorrow. So, check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free at blueapron.com slash legends. That's blueapron.com slash legends to get your first three meals free. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. All right, now back to the show. Rostam's early months were noteworthy. Rudabo was quickly exhausted by the baby's appetite, and no fewer than 10 wet nurses had to be brought in and rotated hourly to satiate little Rostam's hunger for milk. When he was finally weaned, much to the relief of all of his wet nurses, the young boy consistently ate as much food as five full-grown men. The kid that was called, quote, the baby mammoth, when the priest pulled him from the womb, was truly living up to his name. Quickly, he grew and grew. And, one day, his grandfather Sam came to visit from the long war, praising the boy who was rapidly becoming a man. He instructed him to serve the kings, to always choose the path of righteousness, to value wisdom over wealth, and that the world waited for no man. Sam nodded to his grandson. He was growing in years, and the war was long. It had been his dream for the boy to one day join him in battle. But this was likely the last time he'd see either of them. With a final nod, the grandfather climbed atop his elephant and led his army back to war. After Sam's visit, Roston became enamored with his grandfather. It helped that he looked almost exactly like the guy. Regardless, he couldn't wait to get off to war to prove himself. But his father, Zal, insisted that he wait. He was so young, it was said, that he still had milk on his breath. Still, Rostam was relentless and eager. But after a lot of badgering, Zal relented on one point. Rostam could have a horse. After all, the boy would be a famous warrior someday. And he would need a steed. The only issue? Rostam, despite his young age, was once again too manly. He was sure he couldn't even sit on an elephant without breaking the creature in half, resulting in a river of blood. Anytime Rostam sat on any of the royal horses, the animal would bow so low that its belly would touch the ground, and he began to think that he was right. He would never find a horse. That was when he heard galloping. The boy turned, and it was as though the world played in slow motion. A horse herder from far away drove a pack by the city, and this horse... It was beautiful. It was a gray horse with short, stocky legs and a massive, extremely muscular body. Basically, it was like a full-sized Lil Sebastian from Parks and Rec. Rostam watched the horse thunder past and knew immediately that it was the one for him. Unfortunately, there were two main obstacles. One, the horse was the property of the horse herd, and two, the horse's mom was super protective. She looked almost exactly like her son, but she was years older. The prized steed was already as big as his mother. 
anytime someone tried to lasso the horse, she would attack the person like a lion until they either ran away or died. When Rostam lassoed the not-so-little Sebastian, she turned and snorted, rushing him with teeth bared. But Rostam simply turned and literally roared at her. Immediately, the mother stopped mid-charge, deciding that she and this mammoth-like stranger were cool, and she rejoined the herd. Her son, however, wouldn't move, even though Rostam tried to drag the horse closer. With a smile, the young man knew that this was the horse for him. No animal to this point had been able to handle him, let alone resist him. And so, this whole interchange also solved the second problem, that the horse was owned by the horse herd. The story says that he saw how magnificent Rostam was and decided that the price of this horse was Iran. Rostam had to use the horse to defend Iran with all of his might. It was definitely good-hearted patriotism, and not that this crazy guy the size of a mammoth just roared at his strongest horse while trying to steal its son. Regardless, Rostam finally had his horse, named Rakish. Zal was so happy that he was moved to tears, opened up the treasury, and made it rain gold in the streets. The king is dead. Long live the king. Wait, he's dead too? Okay, yeah, we're in trouble. Such was the sentiment echoed by basically everyone throughout Iran. Soon after Rostam had chosen his horse, the elder king had died leaving his inexperienced son on the throne. The king of Tehran, King Afrasab, smelled weakness and quickly attacked. Now, Tehran makes up modern-day Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and the northern parts of Afghanistan and Pakistan. It's generally what we consider to be Central Asia today, and they were the enemies of the Persians at the time of our story. Years after they had come to an uneasy truce, the Tehranians stormed the city and killed the new king, throwing the region once again into war. With Sam gone, Zal was the champion, so he tasked himself with gathering together the nobles, uniting the land, and driving back the Tronians. This was a mammoth task, but luckily there was Zal's mammoth son to the rescue. Zal installed another king of Iran, some faraway relation with royal blood, and then he set to work putting together a battle plan. A battle plan that went right out the window when Zal's large adult son, Rostam, went charging right into battle on the back of his buff pony burst right through the Tyranian line and wrenched the king from his horse by his own belt. He was going to take the man back to the new king, K. Kabad, as a trophy. Unfortunately, he didn't tuck the enemy king under his arm, but kept holding him by his belt, dragging his face through the dirt and rocks until the belt snapped. The defeated king tumbled to the ground and his own warriors formed a circle around him, but the damage was already done. The men had witnessed their king being ripped from his horse and dragged through the battlefield. They knew what this meant, and they fled in every direction. The Iranian army chased after them. Surprisingly, the rival king survived, delivering a riverside soliloquy, where he stated that the Iranians, with Rostam at the head, were the masters of the world, and that neither he nor anyone else would ever best them, so they might as well not even try. He sued for peace, and K. Kabad, the new Iranian king, granted it. It wasn't without a lot of argument from Rostam, however, insisting that Tehran didn't deserve it. Really, he should unleash Rostam in their lands and let them see what his mace could do. They'd never attack again. Mainly because they'd all be dead, but, you know, details. K. Kabad held up his hands. He liked Rostam's initiative, truly, but a kingdom at peace was preferable to one at war. Still, he'd make sure that the Tronians didn't attack again in his lifetime, because he was going to make Rostam the king of the providence on the border. Like his father and his grandfather, Rostam would be a king. He was to keep his weapons sharp and his spears dipped in poison because wherever there was a kingdom, there was war. Only, there wasn't war. Not as long as K. Kabad lived, that is. When he came to the capital, he decreed that his kingdom would be guided by righteousness and generosity. If even an elephant fought with a mosquito, there would be consequences in his land. Ease came from effort but people with great wealth were to share it and be grateful to share it. He protected them and they could help out their fellow man. As such, anyone who worked but still couldn't get enough to eat was to come to him to be fed. Kekobot's kingdom persisted in peace for a hundred years until the king, over 120 years old, 
began feeling a bit weak. It seems like half of being a good king is making sure you have a succession plan in place, and that's something that Keikaba did. He summoned his eldest son, Keikavas, and shared that his journey was just about complete. He only wanted to pass on a bit of wisdom to the boy. Don't let greed and ambition snare your mind. If you do, you'll be unsheathing a dark sword that will only be used against you. With that, the celebrated king, Kay Kabad, passed away. His policies had kept the peace from within, while the watcher on the wall, Rostam, had kept the peace from without. There was just one problem. They wouldn't be fighting the kingdoms of this earth. A righteous land flourishing unchecked had attracted the attention of something else. Something far darker and more powerful. And it was coming for the new king. Wait, what's that sound outside? Kate Kavas asked abruptly a few years later. He propped himself up on the pillows and waved away the women with the grapes. His servant said that there was a man outside playing the lute. He had a hit new song about how beautiful Mazandaran, the land of the demons, was really awesome. That was a bit suspect to the servants and literally everyone else who heard the song because Mazandaran was a horrifying place that no one escaped alive. Kate Kavas didn't care, though. He was bored and there was a new song, so he wanted to hear it. Against all the advice of his advisors, he listened to the song and he loved it. Good art can make you rethink something you thought you knew and see it from a new perspective. And if you're a bored and kind of unwise king, bad art sung by a demon obviously tricking you into visiting the land of the demons can do the same thing. He loved the song so much that he decided to do what neither his father nor any of his ancestors had been able to do. He would not only visit the land of demons, but he would invade it and put them to the sword, taking all their stuff. Any survivors would pay taxes. Boom. War paid for. All right. Who's ready to go? No one. That's who. No one was ready to go. His generals assured the nobles that it was all the daytime drinking talking. No one was stupid enough to invade the land of demons. You couldn't even fight them. They used magic, so normal weapons couldn't even touch them. No. No one was that stupid. And yet, Kekavis was. He had grown up in the shadow of men like his father, Sam and Zal. He knew that to make his own mark on the world, he had to do something drastic. Zal was recalled from his kingdom. Maybe he could talk some sense into the man. But the 100 plus years had taken their toll on the old champion. His skin began to wrinkle and match his white hair. Maybe a century ago, he would have had the presence to speak truth to power. But he only came across as a weak old man in the eyes of the new king. Kekavis wasn't convinced. He mobilized the entirety of Iran's army and marched for the land of demons, leaving behind Zal and various other conscientious objectors. When he returned from the land of demons, he would take their crowns next, but at least he would have someone guarding the home front. Kikawas laughed. Land of demons? More like land of... weak things. Kikava shook his head. Pithy sayings weren't his thing, but you know what was his thing? Conquering. As it turned out, it was super easy too. There was absolutely no resistance from the moment they entered the land of demons. The army just found villages full of women and children. And Kikavas gave everyone the order to separate their souls from their bodies. Which they did. Very easily. A week's worth of looting later and they were ready to move on when, huh, the sky turned black in the middle of the day. That was probably okay, right? Then, there was a flash. Kate Kavis had to shield his eyes, and when he opened them again, he couldn't tell. It felt like they were still closed, but they weren't. He was blind. From screams arising all over the city, he could tell that his army had been blinded as well. It might have actually been better that way, though they didn't really stand a chance against the 12,000 demons that came pouring over the next hill. But at least if they were unable to see them, it would be way less terrifying. It was 
months later, when the rider, bruised, beaten, and bloody, collapsed outside the walls of Zal City, he had been hand-selected by the White Demon, the champion of the land of Mazandaran. Only a quarter of Kate Kavis' army could still see, but to a man, they had been captured. Right before the soldier lost consciousness, he said he had a message from the King of the Demons. Zal gasped as the soldier gave him Kay Kavis' jewel-encrusted crown. The soldier was sent to convey the message to Zal that he had the king and he had the Iranian army. He was going to torture them and kill them, and there was nothing that Zal or anyone in Persia could do about it. Zal took the crown of his king in his 130-year-old hands. He was too old to go, but there was another. It was time for Rostam to come down from his post. It was time for him to go to the land of demons and save his king. Little did Zal know, however, that this was exactly what the white demon wanted. Next week, we'll see Rostam and buff little Sebastian embark on seven Hercules-style labors to save the king. I want to say thanks to Jane MB, Punk Row, Dixon64, Blee Bloon, Alley10145, Kremlin Dusk, Big Brown Bjorn, Saffit, Melly Yelly, Ian Allis, and Mouse Trainer for their reviews on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much for your reviews. It's great to hear from you. And if you'd like to leave a review, Apple Podcasts is still the best place. And you can find the show there at apple.mythpodcast.com. There's also a membership thing on the site. For less than the price of giant googly eyes, you can get extra episodes, source pack ebooks, and ad free versions of the show that won't stare off into nothingness and really only get googly during an earthquake. Check out support.mythpodcast.com for more info on the membership. The creature this week is the jackalope from Douglas, Wyoming in the United States. Okay, so this is kind of like the drop bear. I can't tell if people actually believed in the jackalope at some point or if it's always been this tongue-in-cheek thing. The most famous version started when a couple of brothers, who studied taxidermy by mail, returned home after hunting jackrabbits. They tossed the carcass next to some antlers, and thus, the jackalope was born. A combination of jackrabbit and antelope, the jackalope is about the size of a normal rabbit, but with horns, and a lot of other totally logical and reasonable attributes. The jackalope can run 65 miles per hour, and with its horns, it's only slightly less deadly than the rabbit from Monty Python, because once the jackalope gets up to speed, it can gore anyone pretty easily. You have to be pretty antagonistic toward the thing, though, because it's usually pretty shy. If it does start rushing you, the only thing that can stop it is a buffalo gun. I've read that it's the product of a male jackrabbit getting together with a female antelope somewhere down the line. Though the legendary jackalope can procreate on its own, but only during flashes of lightning, and not without extreme difficulty due to the horns. Speaking of mating, if you manage to catch a jackalope and are extremely dexterous, the jackalope milk is a powerful aphrodisiac. If you're looking to catch one, my first bit of advice is don't, but if you can't be persuaded, you can buy the creature's favorite drink, whiskey, and set it out for it. It can allegedly mimic human speech. Though the only time it felt safe enough to get close to humans to learn speech was when cowboys were singing around a campfire, and so the rabbit has a beautiful singing voice. If you're visiting Douglas, Wyoming, you can apply for the jackalope hunting license. It's only valid in Wyoming on June 31st, and if you're caught hunting without the license, you'll be fined $13, or sentenced to 13 months of hard play in Douglas, Wyoming. I'll link to a PDF of the license on the post at mythpodcast.com. The jackalope is apparently big in Wyoming, so much so that the state has tried to declare it as the official mythological creature of Wyoming. Of course, because we can't agree on anything ever in this country, the motion to install a mythological creature to a newly created, symbolic designation has twice failed to pass the Wyoming Senate after making it through the House. That's it for this week. The theme song is by the band Broke for Free, and the Creature of the Week music is by Steve Combs. There are links to even more music in the show notes, and today's episode was hosted and written by me, Jason Weiser. Our story editor was Carissa Weiser. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you next time.